and what we are and are not. Okay, well, uh, if you got that notification, we're recording. So we're going to uh, restart the before we get started. Um, whenever you do a presentation like this, um, it's always good to have an idea what you are and are not aiming at and what the goals are. Um, so to start, um, historical accuracy isn't really a thing. So we're going to be aiming at historically inspired or sufficient. Um, we don't have the same materials. We don't have the same cultural backgrounds. It's it's a little too hard to aim at historical accuracy in this day and age, but you can get as historically inspired or sufficient um, or adequate as you would like. Um, and we want to remember that everyone wants to dress differently for the fair historically, different eras, um, different levels of accuracy. So that's just something to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is historical clothing depends on layers to create the right silhouette. Um, but wearing a ton of layers isn't everyone's preference either. Um, and as we go through this, we need to remember that historically people aimed at silhouettes. They didn't aim at changing their bodies. They aimed at changing the layers to create the shape. So, for example, if you are straighter and you're in the Victorian era where they kind of wanted this, you added padding up here and down here. You didn't necessarily cinch that in. So that's something to keep in mind as we look at port because most of them are a very idealized people. They are paintings. Um, they are not how people looked in the everyday life necessarily. These are the ideals of the time. So that's something to keep in mind. Something else to keep in mind is while I'll mention the main layers, um, there are exceptions to the rule and there are people who aren't going to want to wear uh, three layers to the fair in Florida in the heat. Um, so we're not saying you have to wear the layers. Um, if you want, here they are. I am going to be focusing more on the outer layers because if you're anything like me, that's what you want to be sewing right now. Um, there are class differences. Um, there are sumptuary laws. Just a quick note on sumptuary laws. They do change. Um, the ones we think about the most are requiring uh, certain people, certain religions for wearing certain things um, or requiring them to wear certain things to identify that. Uh, we're not going to be getting that deep into them because I feel like that would be another hour um, long class. Uh, they do change and develop depending on who's in charge and who's making them. Uh, but we'll mention them briefly. Um, class differences, I'll point out a few of the changes. Most of what we're going to be talking about is going to be upper class. Um, because they really take base layers and just add more, which is really what um, when we're dressing for the fair, most of us aim at. And this is very focused around what we're aiming at at the fair. Um, fairs around the country can vary in theme. Uh, most of the ones I've been to have been medieval or Tudor. Uh, there are specifically Celtic, Viking um, fairs. There are fairs in other decades, um, like a Charles Dickens fair. Um, we all talk briefly about them, but we're really going to be talking mainly medieval and Tudor in this. Um, really, the most important thing is to have fun. Uh, we forget that sometimes as history people that just because you didn't get that button exactly right or something's not going exactly as you planned that this is really about having fun. So I would love everyone to what I want everyone to take from this is um this is some cool ideas that are historically reflected that we to the um i'm not not that this is what you have to aim at and do we're all at different levels we're all at different parts of the journey so just something to keep in mind also keep in mind that if you can't afford the price of wool poly wool is a thing and so thrift stores and that's where i am so um, I am wearing what used to be bed sheets right now. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we're all at different levels in our journey. Um, for questions, I'm going to try to take them along the way, uh, but it's going to get a little difficult, um, especially with I don't even know how many people are watching right now. Uh, my lovely husband has volunteered to monitor the chat. Um, and he's going to kind of wave at me 
Um, if there's a question that I should take right then and there, I am going to ask that if your questions can wait until the end that they do. But if it's something specific that I said, please feel free to enter it into the chat so everyone could see it and I'll be waved at to know that uh, there's a question that needs answering. Um, so last thing before we get started, courses. Um, I'm not going to go deep into what the difference between bodies, stays, and corsets are. I am going to try to use the correct terminology. Um, I recommend watching Abby Cox's video on YouTube um, where she does a full history and comparison of the history of, I'm going to call it corsetry, even though it's not. Um, but again, that video is 30 minutes, and I don't think anybody wants to be here for three hours with all the nitty gritty. Um, but if we want me to, I can do that another time. So with that said, uh, please use the chat if you just want to talk to each other. I'm not watching it. Uh, it will be recorded, so don't put anything in there you'd regret, but feel free to chat with each other freely. That's what this open forum is for. It's so that we can have communication while we do this instead of just recording something. So feel free to use the chat um, as much or as little as you would like. Okay. So we're starting in the medieval period, falling between uh, the fall of Rome in 476 CE and the beginning of the Renaissance in the 14th century, which is the 1300s. Uh, we don't have a lot of extant items um, or uh, period items from this time. Um, whenever you hear the word extant, it refers to surviving uh, clothing or items from the period that would be used to study. So that's your archeological evidence. We don't have a lot of that. So we rely a lot on poor literature and other art. Um, we rely a lot on um, actually manuscripts and paintings in there to kind of figure out what people wore. Um, the thing about the medieval period is when you're going to the fair uh, and you want to dress a certain way, uh, medieval, Viking, and Celtic could all kind of fall into the same category. Uh, so this is a good one to pay attention to. They'll touch on Viking and Celtic specific things later on uh, in this presentation. Um, so basic layers for a woman is going to be the smock, um, chemise, shift, smock. They're all the same garment. Your under layer is going to be linen. Next, you're going to have a kirtle, which is going to be your support uh, garment. There was no bone structure at this time period. There was not um, any sort of stay corset or bodies in this period. Uh, they actually would firmly lace up um, a tighter dress. I don't want to call it tight lacing, but there'd be spiral lacing or it would be buttoned. And that would keep everything in place and be the supportive uh, garment for uh, the bust and the body. Um, I have worn a kirtle in this style, and let me tell you, it is very supportive. Um, and uh, I was postpartum, uh, so I can tell you that even with breastfeeding body, it was very supportive of everything and made everything feel just fine. Uh, so it is more supportive than you would think. Uh, next would be your overdress. Um, for a woman, uh, the overdress varies slightly based on when in the Middle Ages you would fall in uh, what you want to be doing. Um, we'll get into the two main styles of that briefly. Uh, you can just wear a kirtle and not put an overdress on it. And if you were trying to represent somebody of a lower class or a middle class, that's probably what you would do. Um, the kirtle could also be varying levels of decorative um, based on your class and how much you can afford to make it decorative and how much of an expensive fabric uh, you can purchase. So looking at this picture right here, you can kind of see that she has a kirtle on underneath and then an overdress. And you really see this, this blue part would probably be the kirtle. And then this would be an overdress. Um, for men, they would wear a shift under tunic or a shirt. Um, used interchangeably. Again, linen, that would be the layer that gets washed all the time. A knee-length outer tunic with a belt, uh, woolen trousers or um, hose, and maybe male or pin cloak, or they would wear a long overdress instead of the shorter outer tunic. Um, and yes, it would be called a dress. More on that a little bit later. Um, so let's just discuss kind of the main outer layers. Uh, so regardless of class, Women are going to be wearing a kirtle. It's their support garment. It's holding everything together. Uh, there were a few different types 
uh, you will see spiral rate laced up the front that's often goes under. Um, if you are a breastfeeding mom, it is the perfect outfit to be wearing. And in fact, there is a, um, in a manuscript, uh, they drew a picture of Mary breastfeeding Jesus in a front laced hurdle. Um, so that's something to keep in mind uh, if you are in that area of your life, um, because let me tell you, that was a struggle trying to figure out what to wear to the Renaissance Fair during that area of my life. Um, they did have a button up kernel and they did have side lacing. Um, at this time period, it would be often spiral laced. Um, again, this is your supportive garment simply be by compressing and holding the body. It would just be well made and tight fit. Um, but not fully compressing and really moving anything where it shouldn't be. Um, the sleeves could be pinned on or um, laced up if they're already part of the garment so that they fit tightly. Uh, the examples over here were probably laced up sleeves because they look attached. If you look over here, these would be pinned on. Pinned on sleeves can be changed depending on if you're going to a more formal event or if you're washing dishes and want to be able to easily wash the sleeves. Um, a low wide neckline was popular uh, in this time period. There was an effort uh, at one point in the 14th century to raise that neckline. Um, it failed. Uh, they were not as modest as we like to think. Um, in case you couldn't tell from my guest the decades, uh, there was a lot more showy than we would think that they had, um, but they were fond of low wide necklines. Um, now could be worn, as I said, with just the smock underneath or an overdress. We're going to talk about the main sorts of overdresses uh, in the next slide. Um, just touching on a heraldic gown, um, there is portraiture of people wearing heraldic dress. We don't see really any evidence that this was any sort of a common wear or um, specific to any sort of event. Um, we think that it was just representative pictures, um, unless, you know, we're proven otherwise in 10 years or so. That happens in history uh, with stuff like this a fair bit. Um, that said, they are very fun to make. And if you looked at the picture um, that I'm wearing for the announcement for this, I am in my heraldic hurdle, and I highly recommend anybody who wants to do it to make a heraldic type outfit because it is just fun. Um, so, okay, the surcoat. Uh, the surcoat is um, an outer garment. Uh, worn over the kernel. Um, any sort of outer gown could be called a surcoat and would have been called a surcoat. So even though we're going to be talking about a um, houppelande, uh, the next slide, that is still a type of surcoat. Uh, they really varied um, the surcoat in the early to mid Middle Ages tend to be closer fit to the body on top. And then the sleeve were all over the place. Uh, you could have these huge draped sleeves. You could have the sleeves like you see on the left that are tight fit to here and then hanging and you can actually see the red kirtle underneath uh, the lady to the left. Or you can wear them completely sideless. Uh, the ladies in the right hand picture, that red uh, dress that you see is actually the kirtle. So that's the undergown. And then the, the overgown is um, your surcoat. Uh, so it's actually completely sleeveless and open. Um, generally, fur was kind of an upper class thing. They actually restricted that um, to the upper class at one point. So you, while you will see fur in some of the portraiture, um, it's really restricted to the upper class. Pockets also weren't really a thing in your surcoat, but they did have an opening in the surcoat that you can reach your hands into and reach all your pouches. So while it wasn't necessarily a pocket like we think of nowadays, there still was a way to hold things, which is better than our jeans of today. Uh, so at least there's that. Uh, the Hoopalond, this would have been your uh, later medieval wear. Um, again, type of surcoat, type of overdress. These were much looser. These were reserved for the upper class because of the sheer amount of fabric. If you wore a hoopalond, you had the money to just buy fabric for fabric's sake. 
Um, there was a tie around the belt. These did tend to have a higher neckline and be more modest. Um, but it really uh, was less of a functionality and more of a show of wealth to wear these. Um, I will say that if you are in the pregnant area of life, this is an excellent outfit to wear because there's plenty of room that you don't have to worry about when exactly you're going to be at the fair because there's just fabric. Um, okay, men in the medieval period. This is one of my favorite periods for menswear simply because there's at least three identifiable styles. Uh, there is your short tunic with either um, your woolen trousers or your hose tied with a belt. They did wear a long dress and it was called a dress then. I have seen it referred to as a robe, but that's more looking at um, how we would refer to it modernly or uh, in later centuries. Um, from what I understand, they would have called it a dress simply because what you wore was your dress. It wasn't what we think of today as a dress or a gown for a wedding. It, it was it was your outer layer. It was how you were dressed. So they did wear a long dress, um, overdress. Uh, they also <laughs> were, um, if they were in the upper class because this was a restricted style. They could wear a short tunic with very tight hose that would show off their assets. If you look over here, this gentleman uh, is showing off quite his assets. Uh, that was a style. Um, to put it uh, by Margaret Scott in Fashion of the Middle Ages in England in 1463, the wearing of short tunics that revealed the, revealed the male buttocks was restricted by law to the upper classes. She goes on to say that they didn't even want to contemplate that the common folk had buttocks. So they were not permitted to wear this style. Um, so if you are a man, you want to go into the fair and wear a medieval garb, you really have three options here, um, well represented in these photos. Uh, if you want to look up the tighter style, there are pictures of just those men, uh, usually from behind. Um, I guess if you got it, flaunt it. But... Uh, I did have a question in the uh, Facebook group about shoes. Now, uh, shoes are not something I'm particularly knowledgeable in, despite the fact that I love wearing them. Uh, but I did do some research uh, because this person really wanted uh, to know what type of shoes to wear. Um, what was worn in the Middle Ages really carries through for the most part, with the exception of that shoe on the bottom. Uh, the turn shoe method was really the main method of making shoes. So that is in your upper left-hand corner. This is actually an extant example. Um, what they would have done is they would have had the shaft of the shoe, they would have sewn around it and then flipped it inside out to protect that seam on the middle. Um, I think Nicole Rudolph on YouTube uh, did a very good tutorial. It was either her or Morgan Donner that did a tutorial on how to make your own version of a um, turn shoe. So this is what they would have worn. It could have been slip on, it could have been lace, and it could have had buttons. So any of those three would be um, historically accurate depending on how you put them together. Um, the Krakow shoe, not sure if I'm saying that correctly, uh, is this pointed shoe you're seeing on the bottom. Uh, this is also where we get the idea of a shoe turned up like that, that you see in kind of gestures uh, of the time, kind of later era, you would see them wear that. Um, this shoe came uh, into being, it was very popular. Um, it had a pointed front, uh, so pointed and long, in fact, that they had to stuff it. And it was um, the most, a uh, shaped element of a lot of these clothes for a long time that they stuffed the shoe and they started getting so ridiculous that they restricted them by size so depending on your class you were only allowed to have a shoe point that went a certain distance beyond your toes so the more the higher class you were the further along that point could be from your toes um this was actually banned in Paris in 1368. My guess is because they were all tripping over their own feet and other people's feet. Um, but it, it was banned. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the law actually calls them ridiculous, if I'm remembering correctly. 
Um, and then this was banned in London in 1463, where it really went out of fashion. Um, so if you're looking for shoes to wear with a medieval outfit, I would go with your upper left-hand corner, but by all means, you can explore the Krakow shoe. It was a thing, and this is a real excellent uh, example of one. So when we think of Renaissance fairs, most of us think of Queen Elizabeth. Um, this would be your Tudor period wear. So we're moving from the medieval uh, to the European Renaissance. This is your 14th to 17th centuries. Um, most fairs that I'm aware of take place in the 16th century. Um, many that I've been to have focused on Queen Elizabeth, either somewhere in her reign where she's meeting with dignitaries or um, she's going to be coronated. Um, but that's just my experience. Fairs, again, vary. Um, the Tudor period uh, would be 1485 to 1603. So falling um, towards the early middle to uh, end-ish here there of the European Renaissance. Um, I did put a little information remembering that King Henry VIII uh, started the Church of England, uh, six wives, three children. Um, interesting character was King Henry VIII. Um, Elizabethan era would be your 1558 to 1603. Uh, there were huge changes of dress in this period and you don't see it at first and then you get into the Elizabethan era and they, I, I, it, it's interesting. You don't see things like it again until you get to certain runways today where they see how big and unwearable they can make things. Um, but Let's uh, move forward with the understanding. The undergarments remain the same. We start with a shift and some type of support garment, and I'll get a little bit into those with these slides. Um, because no one wants to sit here and hear me talk about every decade in excruciating detail, despite the fact that I would probably be very willing to do that on any normal day. Uh, this is a fair representation of men and women in each of these early decades of uh, the Tudor period. In the 1480s to 1490s, uh, you'll see Henry VII is king um, up till 1509. And we're still seeing styles that are fairly reminiscent of medieval period. You have the wide neckline. Um, you still have a lot of draping. Your kirtle would still be your main support um garment in that time period we're going to transition to the 1500s uh to 1530s um where king henry the eighth is king until 1547 um low wide necklines um unless you're wearing a partlet because it was quite chilly um were still common uh you can see them throughout the portraiture they still largely resemble kirtles at that point. Your undergarment wouldn't exactly be a kirtle. It would be a bodied petticoat. Uh, they would um, stiffen the linen underneath. So you're starting to see the stiffening of undergarments instead of just uh, a close fitted garment being used. Uh, so this, again, we're not getting into stays, bodies or corsets yet, but it is more of a stiffened undergarment at this point. Um, the gabled hood started to be a thing. Uh, if you were in France, you'd have the French hood. And we watched men's tops get more elaborate as King Henry VIII really liked French fashion. Uh, you'd probably recognize in the 1520s, the gentleman on the left uh, as the King of France. Uh, I put him up as one of our guests of decades. And apparently that I made that too easy. But, you know, um, I liked the outfit. Um, but King Henry VIII was very much inspired by his fashions. So we see the very elaborate tops for the men. Okay, now we're starting to get a little bit different and a little bit more interesting. Um, in the 1540s, uh, we see the farthingale start to become a thing. And at this point, it was a cone shaped skirt uh, support. So that, that's why we're seeing the cone shaped bottom of the skirt. Um, and we're seeing a very wide neckline on top. Um, to me, this is the widest that we're going to see the neckline uh, in this presentation. Uh, this is Catherine Parr all the way to the left. Um, it really, by widening the top and the bottom, it creates a illusion of a very small waist. It would still be the same type of structured petticoat underneath um, stiffened petticoat. We still would not be seeing stays, bodies, or corsets. Um, we're seeing 
we're seeing on the gentleman over here, this is Edward the Sixth. Uh, we're seeing that you still get very elaborate men's fashions. Everything's pretty broad. Um, and it, it, the women, while you have more of a hourglass shape, you're really seeing the men's fashions grow. As we get into the 1550s, uh, we are seeing uh, Mary take over the throne uh, from 1553 to 1558. And you'll see that, uh, look. We're covered. Um, we also have collars. I don't know if you can see over in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, this is a ropa. This is a fashion uh, that came over that is distinctly different from the different garments we've seen before. It's very reminiscent of what Edward VI is wearing right here. A uh, very reminiscent of men's fashions. It was very open um, with buttons on top. And I've also seen it in portraiture just be completely open. It had loose sleeves like the men's style garments to about elbow length and then was tight fit below it um, with a structured garment underneath. Um, the picture of Mary over here, who would later adopt that style, we see Catherine of Austria. Well, Catherine of Austria is over here wearing um is very rigid um we see a very rigid we see a rigid collar on um, bringing it up still bringing it very out so basically everything's growing up and out and then down and out still making the waist very very small and now we see things really start to get interesting uh, everything is still shifting upwards and outwards um, as collars for both men and women uh, get taller, uh, ruffs begin to become a thing, uh, sleeves continue to get very, very large. Um, collars are the tallest we see um, in this whole period uh, in the 1560s. That's not to say that they didn't look taller in any of the later decades. It's just that it's a separate garment to add a ruff or a separate collar. This collar is still often um, part of the garment in the 1560s. Um, so they continue to grow up. In the 1560s, we see the addition of a medium-sized ruff. Yes, those are medium-sized ruffs. They only get bigger from there. Um, the shoulders and the women's dress start to fall slightly off the shoulder to widen the silhouette. Uh, men's fashion starts to become more constrained. You still have more of a puff sleeve. Uh, you have a slimmer silhouette uh, than you've seen in other uh, decades, but you will see in the 1570s portrait, he has a slight, almost beer belly. They actually added padding there to make it look that way. They added a stiffened garment or stiffened fabric to create, yeah, Ken's very excited. I can see you there. Uh, to create a belly as part of the silhouette. Uh, so that's the main like difference in the torso area of the men from the 1560s to the 1570s. Uh, beer bellies were in, uh, flat stomachs were out. Um, so moving, moving further and upwards, uh, we see that things only get more exaggerated for the women and more, uh, We'll call it constrained for the men, even though their tops are still very elaborate. They are at least visibly wearable garments. Um, two styles that were very popular with the collar. You have the wired collar or you have the ginormous ruff. Uh, it was up to the lady and her tailor and her dress uh, what she wanted to wear that particular time. The sleeves were absurdly large. And the uh, previously cone-shaped farthingale is now a more table-shaped farthingale um, and was actually made of whalebone. Um, so it's one of the early uses of whalebone. The whaling industry is really starting to pick up around this time. If you look closely around here, I don't know if you can see it on your screen or if you want to look it up later, the dress is actually tucked almost like you would tuck a tablecloth to make it lay nicer on a table. That's what they did. They would pin this to tuck it under uh, that, that to create that shape. Um, it's really rather interesting that they just kept getting larger. 
Um, the men kept getting smaller and I can only imagine that that's a direct counter to not wanting the women's skirts to get any larger or trying to fit through the door with your loved one. Um, I have no historical evidence for that, but I can't even imagine wearing that table that uh, Catherine Perry is wearing. Uh, that would be the Countess of Nottingham. Uh, around this time, we actually start to see bodies be worn. Um, so there are two extant examples I'm aware of. One of them is a Queen Elizabeth's effigy bodies. Uh, a pair of bodies would have been your precursor to the uh, stays, which came before the corset. It's your first really boned garment. They were extremely long. They created this long torso that you see here. So the torso of her body is made to look like this. So if you see how long that is, uh, that is created with a pair of bodies. Uh, it comes from a French word. Please don't ask me how to pronounce it. Um, but it's a pair of bodies because it represents the two sides of it being tied together to help create that shape. So really this era, uh, it's out and then out in the skirt and then just up and the hair went up with it. Um, so that's really a very quick tour through the Tudor era. Um, we're going to briefly look at some real existing Renaissance fairs compared to portraiture. Uh, but before I do that, are there any immediate questions that come to mind? Going once, going twice, sold. Looking at real Renaissance fairs. So this is my guess to what era that they are supposed to be representing. Um, and what I like about this is they don't have to be exact. No dresses were the same. There were exceptions to every rule, but it's fun, at least for me, to look and go, this Queen Elizabeth is at this time period. Uh, so right now we're looking at the Carolina Renaissance Festival. I believe that some of our uh, lovely admins uh, often go to this festival. Uh, so it's why I picked it. Um, looking at the Carolina Renaissance Festival website, they say that it takes place in the 16th century, which is very wise because it means that they don't have to follow a specific century when it comes to fashion. Much wiser than my home fair, the PA Renaissance Fair, who decided to set in a specific year this year. Uh, so we'll have fun with that in a second. Um, this is the Queen. This is from their own website. I'm assuming this is Queen Elizabeth. They just called her the Queen on their website uh, when I looked at their media pictures. If I had to guess, she is supposed to be representative of uh, this nice portrait of a young woman from 1567 or a similar garment. I saw other pictures on Facebook of this Queen uh, in a slightly more similar top. Um, but she's living her best life in that outfit, and I love it. Um, on to the PA Renaissance Fair, good day PARF. Uh, this year, the 2021 program had it set in 1585. If you remember the 1580s, it was like, um, instead of, uh, so, uh, this is from the casting page. She did wear other outfits throughout the fair. Um, if you know anything about the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair, you know that it starts at the end of August and goes through the last weekend of October, which means we start the season in 90 plus degrees weather and we end the season in 40s. Sometimes it's 30 degrees if it had just been raining and it was the last weekend and the sun had just set. So you see a big transformation in what the cast is wearing, depending on whether or not they felt like freezing or overheating. Um, so we did see several different outfits from Queen Elizabeth, which is very standard for this fair. If I had to guess, I would say that she is supposed to be circa 1575, so about a decade off, but she's the queen. So, you know, she makes the style as far as anybody's concerned. Uh, but the outfits to me are fairly similar. I knew we'd have some gentlemen, so I want to make sure you got some equal representation. So again, from the uh, 1585 program, um, if I had to guess, they were trying to be representative of uh, Robert Dudley, who was a fashion icon uh, during this time. Uh, he's probably the most famous uh, 
representation of uh, this late Elizabethan era fashion, but this is actually a picture from uh, circa 1560 to 65 of him. So if I had to guess, they were trying to imitate this style picture, though there are pictures of him in more rough tape garments a decade following in the 1570s. So if I had to guess, that's what these gentlemen are trying to do. They are on the cast. They're typically on the cast of the PA Renaissance Fair, and they're hilarious if you ever actually get to see them. Um, so Texas Renaissance Festival, I know that a lot of people go to this one, and it's one of the few that came to mind when I had to think of who has a king. Um, most of them only have uh, the Queen Elizabeth. They just call him the king, uh, from what I can tell. Um, I've never been to the Texas Fair, uh, but he, um, to me, very representative of this picture of uh, Henry VIII. Um, and again, very smart saying it's somewhere in the 16th century, so no one could go, you're wrong. Um, so to me, this is very representative of um, someone playing up a King Henry VIII. He does have a queen. I couldn't find a picture of her. I don't know if that's indicative of the fact that this is King Henry VIII. Um, for all I know, he's off a few queens throughout the season, uh, but I was easily to able to find a picture of the king on Facebook and not as easily identify the queen, um, though she was mentioned a few times uh, on Facebook. As promised, shoes. Um, the majority of the people were still wearing that turn shoe that we spoke about earlier um, on, uh, so that's what the majority of people in this time period would have worn. Uh, wealthy women could have worn silk or velvet slip-on shoes, but that would have been for indoor use. Uh, in a direct response to that elongated, uh, ridiculous shoe, uh, the duck shoe became popular in the nobility, which made the feet look very squared off. Uh, the picture in the bottom left-hand corner is the same picture as above it, but I zoomed into the feet uh, to try to get a better picture of King Henry VIII and Prince Edward's shoe styles. Can't really see Jane Seymour's shoes. They're hidden under her gown. Um, variants in shoe styles really took off in the Elizabethan era, just like everything else that happened in the Elizabethan era. Uh, we start to see boots. We start to see heels. Uh, there's buskins, top-ins, startups. Uh, if you look on the right, those are all different shoes that would have been worn at one point or another in the uh, Elizabethan uh, era uh, for women. Uh, men typically wore boots that were laced up. Um, working men and women could have worn boots. They could have worn clogs made of wood and the cork shoes became a thing. I don't know why cork shoes became a thing, but cork shoes were in fact a thing. I, but if you wanna wear cork shoes to the Renaissance Fair, it's historically accurate, so go for it. Um, when I go to a Renaissance Fair, I normally pick what I can walk in all day. Um, I would not choose Elizabethan shoes for this reason. Um, going up hills, particularly if you're pushing or pulling a carriage, I don't want the heels. Um, so I would typically wear um, a boot with maybe a low heel, but really a comfortable shoe for walking. So that would be more my suggestion. Even if it's more of a men's style to wear a lace-up boot as a woman, I would wear either a turn shoe or a lace-up boot uh, because blisters are a thing. Okay, briefly touching on different eras that we see uh, at the Renaissance Fair, despite the fact that they aren't necessarily from the Renaissance. Uh, if we look at the pictures on the left, this is part of the golden age of piracy. So if we want to see all the pirates at the fair, the uh, 1660s through 80s uh, is really where you want to be, though the time period of the golden age of piracy runs from 1650 to 1720. I think this is a fairly um, good representation of the styles that we would see at the fair, but a historical version of them. Um, for the women, you see a uh, very long waist off the shoulder neckline and short full cartridge sleeves. That's what this uh, lady over here is wearing. 
Uh, so we would see a lot of that walking around the fair. Uh, at this point, stays are a thing. So that's your fully boned undergarments. Uh, the difference between a corset and a stay is in uh, the beginning of corsetry, there was no bones in it. You could have cording in a corset, but you wouldn't see bones in a corset. If you wanted a boned support garment, they would be the stays. Uh, so this is your um, age of pirate woman all the way on the left. And then we have our gentleman over here who uh, is a fairly adequate example of what you would see if you wanted to be a pirate in the golden age of pirates at the Renaissance Fair. You'll see more of a straight coat with buttons down the front. Uh, you have your linen undershirt. Um, you would have a tight stocking probably up to the knee. And this would be more prevalent a little bit later in like your 1670s, 80s, 90s. Um, and then you're more of a puffy uh, um, bottom pants. Uh, but that that's very representative of if you want to be a pirate and you want to be a pirate who like really did a good job being a pirate and didn't get hang, hung, 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 English, uh, that would be a good representation. Um, I did include uh, some styles from 1720s to 60s on here because Pirates of the Caribbean became a thing. Uh, and if you want to think of a Elizabeth Swan's dress, this is more representative of what they laced her into, uh, even though we wouldn't be seeing, a one, of course, it wouldn't be doing that, and two, no one did that, but that's a different story and a different video, and there's plenty of that on YouTube. Um, this is a very fun garment to wear, lots of frills on top. It's actually very fitted upper bodice and if you look at the skirt here it actually is connected to the bodice through these seams and this is actually part of the petticoat or an underskirt so this is actually an open outer gown and then this underneath um, could be as decorative or undecorative as you want it to be uh, we were all about the frills and decorations um, i'm going to try to pronounce the style names uh, for what this is, but I'm fairly bad at it, so I'm going to apologize in advance. Uh, pronunciation isn't always my forte. Uh, so, a robe a la Francaise or Francaise, YouTube, uh, is one of the styles you'll see, or a uh, robe a la Grace, uh, which is your tight fit back. Uh, the other version would have a loose drape in the back. So those are your choices if you want to be Elizabeth Swan. Uh, we do see the matching gentleman to the right, but honestly, I don't see anybody at the Renaissance Fair choosing that style when you could be a pirate. Um, so I more see Elizabeth Swan with more of this style at the fair. Um, again, it's more fun to do that. Um, you do have a choice in this era. Uh, if you want to wear a corset or stays, you have your choice. Stays is your bone garment that would give you more structure, um, that would uh, hold you in better. But your corset would be very corded, um, would be very tight fit, um, just no boning. Uh, if you want to go earlier in this era, choose stays. If you want to go later in this era, uh, probably choose stays, but you could choose a corset. Hitting very, very briefly on Jane Austen festivals and Dickens festivals. I know um, Mount Hope, where Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair has um, or has had pre-COVID a Dickens era event. So um, they do consider that part of their fair um, offerings, even though it's at a different part of the year. So I want to hit on these. Jane Austen and Regency has been very popular uh because of Bridgerton uh this past year or so uh but it's a very recognizable style high waist they would still be wearing a structured support garment under that um it would just be a, a shorter version of the garment it wouldn't be the full body um and it's very flowy uh very um embroidered 
it's a fun style to wear. I enjoy it. Men's outfits become more of a suit, even if it's not a suit like we think of it today. Uh, you have the high collar, you have tight fit pants, uh, and you have uh, the stockings up to the knees still, but you're really starting to see more of a suit structure. So there's a real separation from what you would have seen in, say, the Tudor or the medieval period at this point. Dickens festivals, uh, if they took place in the evening, this would be represent uh, representative of what they would wear. Um, so they would be very uh, hourglassy shaped with a bell skirt, a frilly top that's off the shoulders, very small waist, which was not cinched. It was an illusion um, by broadening other components of the body. Um, we would see uh, corsetry start to become the main thing. Uh, somewhere in the 19th century, stays gives way to corsets, and they first begin to be used interchangeably, the terms, and then we just see corset takes over as the main term of support garment. Um, and towards this Victorian era, is when we start to see the corset become what we think of. They will start boning it. We will start seeing the corsets have a ton of shape. Something to keep in mind if you do want to do this era, uh, they padded the corset. So they would start with the waist measurement and whatever your waist was, was the starting measurement. So if your waist was this big, which no one's waist should be this big, but if someone's waist was this big, and the shape was like this, even if you were a straighter shaped person, you just added enough padding to create the proportions. So if you were already a curvy person, but you um, had a more voluptuous bottom, they would just pad out the top to equate everything out. Um, they really changed their silhouette to match what was in fashion instead of trying to change their actual bodies to match a size, which is really what we try to do today. Um, it, it's almost, to me anyway, it's a healthier way of looking at body that we want to reach this silhouette. So instead of hurting myself to get there, I'm going to add padding until it looks like I'm there and then call it a day. Um, so if you're going to change for a fashion thing, that, that's a healthier way to do it, um, in my opinion. Uh, but they did not tight lace themselves. I'm sure that somebody did. Um, but that would be like saying Kim Kardashian is what everybody's wearing nowadays. So that would kind of be the equivalent for that. Um, and now hitting on the Viking era. I really want to thank Sons of Vikings, their website, for putting together that top three picture uh, because it so suits what happens. Uh, we have a fantasy version of what everyone thinks the Viking looks at looks like. We have a speculative, what people think could be a Viking, and then we have what they actually wore, which was a very soft, what everyone else wore in medieval era. Um, and you see other examples. The bottom left uh, is a drawing of what they would have worn, and then you see handcrafted history. Uh, they put together reenactor outfits. Um, you see what they're wearing for their Viking festival. Um, there is no evidence that Vikings ever wore horns on their helmet. Uh, there's nothing archeologically or reflective of that. Uh, if you want to be uh, this Viking, the upper left-hand corner of fantasy style Viking, looks fun to me, go for it. But if you want to go for something based on what we de definitely know, this would be the way to go. And if you want something in the middle, thinking that they probably wore leather armor, even if we don't have exact material that says that, this is fun too. Um, Looking at Celtic festivals, we run into an even bigger problem that there are literally thousands of different Celtic tribes that exist and they're all different. Uh, and we can find evidence in writings as early as 1200 BCE that describe what we would think of as a Celtic tribe. So theoretically, they've been around for a very long time and it's not what we think of. Uh, they did travel across Europe and settle in a variety of locations, and each of those locations have a completely different culture eventually. The Gales and the Irish settled in current-day Ireland and started to incorporate their own religion into Catholicism in 432 AD. Um, 
some tribes did go into battle naked, covered in painted designs. And yes, I did see specifically that blue paint was a thing, but not all of them did. So uh, if you want to go into battle naked, that's a good idea, but not at the Renaissance Fair. You'd probably get thrown out. Um, so I, I don't recommend that particular uh, historical accuracy if you want to go to the fair, but it is a fun tidbit of information. Uh, mainly, they probably wore what the rest of medieval Europe wore with the kirtles and the loose garments and overdress. So that's really what they probably wore. Uh, we probably would see a lot of wool, uh, maybe a slightly looser garment cinching at the waist with a belt like we see on the right. Uh, we do see over here on the left, uh, this is a German museum. They had somebody um, recreate a Celtic warrior. Outfits, but again, this is a specific tribe, which they did not state on their website and or I couldn't read the German um, and it didn't translate with Google Translate very well. But uh, this this is in a museum as a Celtic warrior representation, um, but some went into battle naked. So uh, take what you will from the thousands of different tribes. The kilt. Uh, it originated in the 16th century uh, in the Scottish Highlands. This is not my area of expertise, but I really want to make a great kilt, which is located on this upper part right here. It's basically a wearable, very warm blanket, and I don't know why I never created one for October at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. Um, I think I might have to. Uh, but it actually was considered to be a barbaric garment. Uh, it was part of almost the mountain people's wear. Um, and then the quote unquote normal people in the lowlands wouldn't have worn a kilt, which would have been the great kilt. Um, by 1746, it had become popular and by then had shortened to a walking kilt, which is more of the skirt we see today. And then it was widely, widely worn um, when the Highland Regiment of the British Army adopted the kilt um, into their actual military wear. This was their uniform, the kilt. This picture over here is from the National Army Museum for the Highland Regiment. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you see psychological torture happening as they literally played a bagpipe on the battlefields. Uh, so don't mess with the Highland Regiment because you might not be able to hear anything ever again. And I like bagpipes, but I could only imagine how painful you can make that on a battlefield. And then we have everything else. Everything else at the fair is. We have fantasy, fae, romanticized medieval, cosplay, Harry Potter, um, steampunk, science fiction, chain mail that wouldn't have been worn into battle non-historical corsetry, train mail that would have been worn into battle. Uh, many others, you have plated mail, uh, plated mail um, like this gentleman over here, which would not have been worn in the Middle Ages at all. Um, that was not a thing. Um, it's just a romanticized version of what knights would have worn in the Middle Ages. Um, so really, this, this is the fair. Uh, it's an eclectic bunch of everything. It's what you want it to be costuming wise and what you can sew or can find or can put together. Um, so I hope this helps you decide what you want to wear or broadens your options. I know that I'm going to be creating a great kilt at some point in the future um, because it just looks wonderful. Um, so thank you so much for joining me through. Uh, this is a lot of history. Um, and before I say goodbye, I am going to open the floor to questions. Uh, you can see in the bottom left hand corner that is my Instagram if you want to look at any of the things I've sewn. There's not a ton up there since I just recently separated out my personal uh, Instagram from my sewing Instagram because I didn't want all my kids all over the public. Um, I do have two kids that I sew for. Um, but I, if anybody would like to ask questions, I'm going to open the chat. Um, and if I don't hit your question, if I accidentally skip it, um, I am going to call for any more questions. Please feel free to write your question again, because I don't know how many are going to come in at the same time, and I don't want to miss anybody. So that said, I am opening for questions now. So... While everyone is thinking about their questions, I just want to mention that we have uh, classes coming up the next few days, uh, drafting patterns uh, tomorrow, 
intro to inkle and tablet weaving, which I don't even know what that is, but I'm going to find out. Um, hand sewing techniques, which is something I dearly need. I like to sew by machine. <laughs> And uh, how to draft and fit a bodice. Uh, I'm sorry, the hand sewing is on Friday. Uh, how to draft and fit a bodice is the following Tuesday, the 30th. And corset basics is on December 1st. Okay, so I'm being asked to briefly address choosing colors and patterns of fabric. Uh, it, it very much varies per century and decade. Um, if you're looking medieval and you want to try to get close to what would have been uh, historically um, accurate, you want a linen undergarment and probably a wool kirtle. There is evidence of linen kirtles being worn in warmer areas, but you really would want to head towards your wool or linen. Cotton was not really a thing at this point. Um, if you want to look towards your Tudor period, you do have some silk, some velvet, some furs, depending on what class you are. If you're lower class, you still want to stick with your linen and your wool. Um, okay, I hope that that addressed that bit. Uh, how do I find recorded classes sometimes next week? Uh, Christy, you want to, I think we're figuring that out. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we will be able to access this through the, there'll be a Zoom link for that. Um, we also are planning to download these classes to our own YouTube channel, thanks to Kate for setting that up. So uh, we will make them available. And um, yeah, we're kind of excited about all this. Yeah. So uh, look for that. I don't know when that's going to happen, but uh, hopefully soon. Uh, if my OCD kicks in, I'm sure I'll be bugging Christy about that relatively quickly. Uh, so that, that's how we can find reported classes sometimes next week. Were pockets tie on popular through these decades? Yes, yes, because people really did have to carry things. Uh, so tie on um, pouches were very common in especially the medieval times even though you don't see the pockets in the outer garments they did have uh, slits in them so that you could reach in and get to the pouches uh the Tudor period uh it, honestly if you could work a pocket into your skirt go for it because they're big enough that you can hide pretty much anything in those skirts so just make your pockets big enough for snacks and then sewing scissors and you'll be golden um, I can't tell you if they're fully historically accurate to have pockets, but it's certainly easy enough to hide pockets in all those dress folds. Uh, so I highly recommend doing it, even though I forget every time I sew something to put pockets in the seams of my uh, dresses and I end up having to make pouches. Uh, do you have a favorite fabric source? Uh, so if I'm buying just fabric for fabric's sake, uh, if that I happen to see around, I like thrift stores. I like bed sheets. Um, but if I'm actually hunting for specific fabrics, um, if I need a lot and I'm not looking on spending a ton of money, fabricwholesaler.com, uh, I, I was able to get some um, fake silk for $2.50 a yard. Um, so if you don't have a huge budget, that's a good place to go. Fabric.com has a huge selection. Um, not necessarily best fabrics though. Joann's, if you have coupons, will only hurt you a little bit or a lot. Um, but they are at least everywhere. Um, so depending on where you are, I just ordered, um, from, I think it's Nick Stitch in Time. I just got some twill and some denim from him. He's locally, um, he's located up in Allentown, Pennsylvania, I believe, uh, but it's all um, fabric made in the United States. So that's a good place. Um, I think there's, um, what is it? Um, Bern Bernie and Trowbridge or something, uh, I think has wool. If you want historically accurate wool, that's above my price range. So I don't buy there. Um, if you're looking for corset fabric, uh, corsetmaking.com is my go-to place for boning, and they actually have a uh, fabric, um, they have cotille. Uh, so if you want something that's not going to rip on you and 
uh, you want something that you can lace a little tighter than might be suggested, uh, that's my go-to because that fabric is the stiffest fabric I have ever worked with in my life. Uh, just make sure you put something on as a lining because you do not want that anywhere near your skin. Um, Nicola says- have, I'm sorry, we also have a list of online fabric sources as one of our files in the Facebook group. So take a look there. Uh, it's just a collection of online stores that people have added to over the years. Yeah. Uh, fabricstore.com. I see Janie posted that. That's a very good source if you want linen. And they often have sales. If you sign up, they'll actually email you their sales. Um, as you go along, I have friends who uh, really enjoy that. I don't like working with linen, so I don't buy as much from them. I like cotton um, because when you have two kids running around, linen uh, frays a lot easier and you don't know when you're going to finish your project. And I have come back to projects and it's been much smaller than where I would have wanted to leave it. Uh, so it's just not something that I work with a ton, but that is a great place for linen. Um, Nicola, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, I can say that pre-tutor linen shift and supportive spiral lace kirtle is the most comfortable garment. I'm seriously contemplating just giving up modern supportive, modern supportive garments and making it my norm. I agree. I will also add that if you have a true Victorian corset that's fitted, that's fit to your size, it's a lot more comfortable than a bra. Um, and I wore it, uh, several times after having my son because my back was killing me. And I did manage to breastfeed in it at the fair. So it is possible to breastfeed in a Victorian corset. Um, it looks like somebody G7 Think Cute uh, says Fabric Guru is also a good store. Um, did I miss anybody? Questions? Any other questions? Someone seconding the fact on the properly fitted Victorian corset. Jewelry. Um, I really can't speak much to jewelry. Uh, okay, so spiral lacing is um, where you would see a, the holes would be like this. This is the grommets. Uh, so it would go like this, but they wouldn't be um, crisscrossed. It would be um, a lacing that went around like that. I believe that ladder lace is straight like that. So I hope that answers that question from Penny. Yeah, I unfortunately can't say what to wear decoratively, except to say pearls were very popular in the Tudor era. Um, Queen Elizabeth liked pearls. Really, they liked anything shiny, it feels like. Um, the more decorative, the better. Any other questions coming in? No problem. Uh, we do start to see like cross lacing eventually but that's not bathroom trip in a dress um cross your fingers and pray to god um yeah okay so i go to pennsylvania renaissance fair for the most part and we have real bathrooms and that makes life easier uh the one time i went to um new york in a full garb in a porter potty that was fun um, some recommendations that people had was having a tighter fit stretchy skirt that when you go to the bathroom, you can pull that up and over everything and you can really hold that with one hand and go. Um, they didn't really wear closed undergarments until closer to the Edwardian period. So that would be a really late Victorian era, um, probably 1890s um, into the um into the Edwardian. So open uh, draws, um, open uh, crotch draws would be uh, your friend or not even wearing draws and just having the chemise, which would be more, um, which would be more historically accurate. I see bridal body, which is a drawstring in the hem that uh, close, uh, closest to the skin. That's similar to that pull up method that I was talking about. 
I have heard rumors of things like that ripping, but if you make it yourself, uh, it's more sturdy. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, going in forward instead of backing in and just holding all your skirts up does help and kind of straddling the toilet. Uh, but it depends on how many layers you're wearing. Um, any other questions? Big commercial pattern brands. Do you have a preference for more accurate ones? Uh, so I like Truly Victorian for Victorian era courses, uh, corsetry and anything Victorian in general. When it comes to medieval, I drape my own kirtle pattern. It really starts out as all, all rectangles and triangles. There's some really good resources scattered around. Uh, Rosalie, there's a really good medieval source. Let me see if I can pull her name really fast that has some how-tos. It's uh, Rosalie Gilbert. I'll type it into the chat for anybody who wants it. She has a lot of good uh, medieval style information. Um, oh, it would help if I didn't send it to one person. Let me get this to everybody. So she doesn't have patterns per se, but she does have um, some really good resources for drafting your own using what you have. I see Medieval Tailor's Assistant um, up here. I have another pattern um, that uh, from some other random source I found, but I haven't made it yet, so I don't feel comfortable. Once I make it, I'll let everybody know if I liked it or not, but I have it and then I got pregnant and I haven't tried it yet. Um, Okay, uh, hats and hood patterns, haven't made them. Uh, so there are a lot of really good resources on YouTube. Uh, the, oh, the Tudor Courtesan, I think, just put out a French hood uh, tutorial uh, within the past year that was really well done. I think she's also done the gabled hood or at least information on it. So that's a really good resource as well. Um, Tudor Taylor, Margot Anderson patterns I'm seeing. Margot's is good for Italian patterns, which I didn't touch at all, but which is a pity because, you know, my dad's side Italian, but I'm you know, Renaissance Fair, I stick to pretty much England and France. Um, any other questions? Okay, um, well, if you think of another question, uh, feel free to send me a message on Instagram or I'm pretty easily found at this point on Facebook all over the Selling for Renaissance Festivals page. Um, feel free to shoot me a message. Um, any questions come up, um, anything that you're interested in uh, that you would like to see more of or any ideas, I'm happy to take them and either try to find somebody to lead on that or I'm happy to do another one. I don't know how much more you wanna listen to me because we've been at this for over an hour. And while I love history, I don't know if everyone likes hearing me talk about it as much, but um, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Again, my name is Kate. I've been your tour guide for the evening uh, and I'm going to head out um, unless more questions pop up. I'll stay on until most of the people filter out. So if something comes up, let me know. Thank you, Kate. And thank you everyone for participating. And we will put the link out when we have the recording if you wanna refer back to this.